Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dagger Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. And I cannot stop talking about teenagers in a cabin finding the Necronomicon for some reason. And while Ash vs. the Evil Dead would be a much better continuation of the story so far, that's not out on Blu-ray yet, but Evil Dead is. That's Evil Dead, not THE Evil Dead. You know, Evil Dead from 2013. This is the one and only movie in the series that isn't written or directed by Sam Raimi. Raimi is still on as a producer, but the actual meat of the movie was handled by Fede Alvarez. A very small-time director, much like Raimi was when he struck gold with the Evil Dead. In fact, Fade, at the time, was only making really short videos and got picked up because his five-minute-long YouTube video went viral after it got linked by Kanye West. It also works as a really kick-ass example of the butterfly effect. Either way, due to how impressed Raimi was with the indie filmmaker, Fade was given the chance of a lifetime to direct and co-write the big-budget remake of The Evil Dead. Thus, it should come as no surprise that this feels vastly different from the original movie. But hell, it wouldn't be an Evil Dead movie if it didn't rewrite and refilm the events from the first one, so what am I complaining about? Aside from the basic concern of how well it stands up against the original, there's also the bigger question of how good of a horror movie is it by its own merits. So, despite the fact that we just watch the Evil Dead trilogy. Let's take a look at Evil Dead and try to judge it for, you know, itself without thinking about them too much. Our tale begins in the deep, dark woods where a lone woman is being hunted by a mysterious man. <laughs> what is this? Burlap? I specifically asked for Gucci. Before long, another man comes out, and one quick crack to the noggin is all it takes to knock her out. She awakens in a basement, kidnapped by none other than her own father, Harold, played by Jim McLarty. Who are these people? Look, they're good people. That's pretty much all the explanation they give for these guys. How did they get here? What is their relation? Who are they? Good people. As Harold puts it, his daughter, credited as the oh-so-specific teenager, played by Phoenix Connolly, is troubled. She killed her mother, and he is going to help her, along with these extras. Help her by tying her to a pole and setting her ass on fire. Oh. They were so loud, you pathetic fuck! Revealing the horrifying truth that his daughter is in fact a deadite. Or a 21st century college student. Either way, burn the bitch! It's with the help of the nameless good people who never come up again that he's learned that he can free his daughter's tormented soul by cleansing the demon with fire. <laughs> Though I don't think that Buckshot to the Face was one of the established means of how to exorcise the demon. Uh, ah, well, how else are they going to point out that there's a shotgun in the house if they don't paint the walls with gray matter? Suddenly, movie title! And those good people never come up again. We've got our fresh new batch of victims to introduce to the audience, who I don't even have to rattle off because they seem more than ready to do that for me. Hey, Olivia. This is my girl, Natalie. And that's our irresistibly charming Eric. Hey, Mia. The dialogue is awkward, to say the least. Half the time I can't tell if the characters are addressing each other or the audience. Nevertheless, the guy no one gives a fuck about to say his name is David, played by Shiloh Fernandez. Jessica Lucas is his old friend Olivia, whom Natalie, played by Elizabeth Blackmore, deeply offends. The doctor. Actually, she's... I'm a registered nurse. Nurse? Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I thought you were in a more prestigious position. Please forgive me for thinking highly of you. Evidently, Eric, played by Lou Taylor Pookie, is an old friend of David who he has fallen out of touch with. Therefore, Eric is going to be cunty towards him for the whole movie. Not quite as bad as David's sister, though, Mia, played by Jane Levy. I know I look like Roadkill. Oh, you look beautiful, as always. And you're a charming liar. Did the writers even have siblings? They think that this is how brothers and sisters talk to each other? Fuck, I can come up with a more believable scenario in a cutaway skit. How's it going, shit queens of the bitches? Ooh. Still ruling the roost, bitch! And don't mess with a hat. Uh, do you want some jerky? Oh, that makes up for it. Thank you very much. Mm. That's got a really unique flavor to it. Oh, what brand is this? On that note, we can move on to them showing they could almost pass for a hardcore thriller reimagining of Scooby-Doo, as they have their own doggy for the group, Grandpa, played by Inca. But don't worry, this is Evil Dead. Look it, they even have the inexplicable magnifying glass necklace. It's made from a buckthorn tree, 
It's supposed to make your will stronger. <laughs> yeah, so if there's one thing we've learned in this movie series is you can always trust the trees. This establishes that while Mia believes in Wu, Dave is a skeptic, but he is willing to play along as if it'll make her feel better, and that's what this trip is all about, helping Mia get better. Promise me you'll stay with me until the end. I'm not going anywhere. Cross your heart. Okay. Not only is that the wrong side, David, that's your armpit. But what is all this they need to help her with? Well, Mia and her friends have hidden away at the family's old cabin in the woods as a means to keep her under old dark house arrest long enough to kick her addiction to heroin. I promise not to touch this shit ever again. Okay. Let's play cold turkey. If you're trying to quit, do you really think that dumping your drugs in the local water supply is the best course of action? But the problem is their family summer getaway out in the middle of bumfuck Horrorville is a slightly more popular spot than they anticipated, as they find evidence of a break-in and some damage to the home. No bother, they can spruce it up while they look after Mia and have their awkward, badly written conversations. Do you remember that lullaby Mom used to sing us? Baby little baby. Mia, please. I don't think you need sad memories in your head right now. Mom's not a sad one. You may think that establishing things like the characters' histories together might be better suited through actually showing us instead of having them lecture to each other things that they should already know. You know what our final days at the hospital? Mom sometimes thought I was you. By the time Mom got bad, I had just gotten the job at the garage in Chicago. I don't know, I had, I had a hard time finding the right moment to come back. You see, that's your problem. You're thinking of those filmmaking rules like show, don't tell. And this film is too edgy for your concepts of how to properly build a plot and character development. With that in mind, we find out about what happened last time, and that there even was a last time, as Olivia and Eric tell us about that off-screen experience. We already tried this whole thing back in Flint last summer. Took the same dramatic vow of sobriety before checking her dope down the toilet. She lasted eight hours and quit. Great friends, if at first you don't succeed, fuck it. This time though, now that they have the variable of David's presence, that might work, but only if they can convince him to not help his sister when she asks for it. Otherwise, she might OD again. She didn't just OD. Legally, your sister died. They had to defibrillate her. So not only did she jump right the fuck back on heroin, but by surviving, she broke the law. All this reminiscing about more events we never saw also seems kind of strange when you figure that out in the middle of nowhere, David is the weakest link in terms of those who might try to help Mia when she starts suffering withdrawal, so great plan there. It doesn't take long for her to start going nuts on them on top of it, complaining quite fiercely about the horrible stench. I don't know what is wrong with you people, but there is something dead, and it reeks. But there's no smell. It's a metaphor. She's talking about your performance. However, Scooby can help solve this mystery. Turns out the trap door to the basement, which, considering this is part of a house they are familiar with, they should have known was there from the start, hides a trail of blood. It's here we learn that the opening scene took place in this very house, with ass tons of dead animals hanging down there. Shit, something burnt here. This, uh, uh, yeah, I, I know it's from the opening. You don't have to awkwardly splice that in there. Especially considering the fact that you didn't bother showing the mother any of that other previous shit they were talking about that was kind of important that we actually didn't know about, but this shit we saw it ten minutes ago. Nevertheless, they are fucking morons, so they decide not to get the hell out of there, but dig through the shit and collect the most dangerous looking things they can find. A shotgun, some ammo, and this package with garbage bag and barbed wire wrapping paper. As she is suffering withdrawal and super sensitive right now, Mia paces around in the rain which should feel something akin to being shot by 30 miniguns while pans are banging over your ears, so I'd say she's doing pretty good. Eric, however, decides to see what lies beneath the oh-so-inviting packaging. Uh, okay, I, I know the Book of the Dead looks different between movies, sometimes slightly, sometimes greatly, but where the fuck's the face? As he's already gone this far, Eric has no problem opening the book up to see what's inside. He doesn't really know the language, but fortunately there are a few messages written in plain English. The gist of these is, PUT THE BOOK DOWN, YOU FUCKING IDIOT! IT WILL RELEASE EVIL ONTO THE WORLD AND KILL PEOPLE! STOP! That seems pretty cut and dry. Just close it up, walk away, and pretend any of this never happened. Kunda. Or ignore all of the warnings in English and just 
do your duty as a brainless fucking horror movie character. C could do that too. From page to page, he uncovers the hidden words right next to the warnings not to say them lest he unleash evil, and he says them. Panda. Is it the demonic face I'm getting the exorcist vibe from, or the vomiting? Unsurprisingly, the super sensitive Mia is the first to notice something is wrong. Uh, the thing is... It actually has a physical form. And not that super awesome hulky physical form at the end of Evil Dead 2, just a, the creepy girl in the woods. Because you know, we've never seen that before. Mia still thinks it's freaky as hell, though, so she wants to get the fuck up out of there. Not by telling anyone about the creepy shit in the woods, just saying she really wants to go. Of course, everyone has already agreed to band together with zombie-like determination to prevent her escape. We can't lose you again. You're gonna have to stick it out this time. What the fuck are you doing here? Shouldn't you be in the other room masturbating to the Necronomicon? Also, you'd think Eric would be the first to think she's not joking if she did mention the evil dead bitch outside, but of course that detail isn't important. What they've got to do is keep her from escaping, by leaving her in her room unsupervised. Mia. This is evil dead though, so we know she can't escape because when she tries to... the scary demon bitch appears. And of course, you can't just run her down. That would, that would be mean. And you can't slightly swerve away. You can't even just swerve. You have to turn as hard as you can into the woods, don't break, and accelerate down into the lake. Sweet fuck. But it's okay, she survived. Gets her purse, leaves her car, then decides fuck her purse, and slowly crawls out of the lake. But if the demon bitch was already in the lake, then why didn't she just go after Mia in the lake? Why, why'd she wait for her to leave before... Or is she like the predator and wants to give her a sporting chance? While trying to escape her, Mia winds up being bound by brambles. This clearly is giving us the new darker reimagining of the tree rape scene. How do you make it less silly and more scary? Fade thinks you change it from tree rape to vomited eel rape which is only leaving me wondering why in the fuck the evil spirit is represented by this creepy supernatural girl. Either way, Mia is fucked, and shortly after, discovered by the rest of the gang, who bring her back to the cabin. Everyone is worried she needs professional help, which offends Olivia, who is professional and helping. Okay, I am giving her the exact same treatment she would get at a hospital. I've got her sitting in the waiting room for about four more hours, and I'm gonna take her temperature and charge her a few grand. Any protests to the idea of just locking her up and not believing a word she says are quickly silenced, which leads Eric to ponder to himself the story she gave of the trees coming alive to have their way with her. <sighs> Conveniently enough, the Book of the Dead doubles as a storyboard for the whole damn movie. But for some reason, neither the book nor Mia's story mention the thing about the vomited cock eel. Still, he doesn't bring this to anyone else's attention, instead bitching and moaning about how David hasn't spoken to them in so long, their grudge is still valid. David, on the other hand, is checking up on their dog. Yeah, they, they have that dog, remember? Evidently they didn't, as it's been pouring rain for hours and yet they left the fucking thing outside all this time. Not that it's going to be much of an issue anymore, as when they weren't looking, some horrid fate has fallen upon Grandpa. All you have is the murder weapon. You don't have any actual proof Mia did it. You just think Mia did it. And no, I have no idea who the fuck did it, because the movie never tells us who did it. They just show us that David thinks Mia did it. That's great. But when David goes to confront his sister about it, she's busy trying to boil herself alive with the ridiculously overpowered water heater this place has. By the time they get to her, she has blistered her skin. She's still alive, only very badly burned. So David says, fuck Olivia and her waiting room. He's got to take Mia back to town where she can sit in a real waiting room. Only one problem with that plan. This can't be happening. Oh, um, you know, with the way this movie has been mixing things up, I was half expecting the road to be blocked by a Snorlax. So he must take his injured, mentally disturbed sister back to the cabin so everyone can gather around and argue with each other about who's acting the least emotional. Well, nobody could have known she would do something so twisted. No, you should have known. 
We've all been following your lead since we got here. Look, with any luck, it'll stop raining in a couple hours, and we'll be able to cross the creek in the morning, and we'll take her to a hospital. I don't know if you'd noticed this, but, but nothing has been fine. Yeah, like your continued insistence not to bring up all that shit that you've read in the Book of the Dead. I mean, I know it's spoilerific, but if you're actually trying to survive this situation, it kind of helps. Mia spoils this party, showing not only is the sedative they're using useless on her, but they're really stupid when it comes to keeping the only gun in the house out of the hands of the only psychopath in the house. But fortunately for them, she can't aim, just scream a lot when the winds kick up and freak everyone out. You are all going to die tonight. Me first. They finally think maybe securing the shotgun is a good idea, but of course Mia's collapse was merely a trap, resulting in some vomitious goodness all over Olivia's face. Once everyone else joins the struggle, they manage to fight Mia back and trap her in the cellar, where they can calmly show how stupid they are. This is impossible. The book. You read it. You saw this. You're the smart guy in the group. How are you not making the connection? I just gave enough time to put a horse to sleep. And call yourself a nurse? If she wasn't possessed, I would have fucking killed her! David is extra dumb, though, and he thinks she needs more tranquilizers! So Olivia runs off to retrieve them. However, we can tick one more thing off that causes possession in Evil Dead movies. <laughs> Being puked on. Man, if it worked that way in The Exorcist, the human race would be totally fucked. But with the evil after her now, what shall happen? Oh, it's probably that. Which makes the upcoming scene considerably less surprising after the fucking book showed us what the hell was coming without so much as a spoiler warning. But pardon my hypocrisy. But Eric, the guy who's read the book and knows what's in it, for some reason still doesn't see this coming! Oh my god! Who the fuck did you do that? Oh, man, some foundation is just impossible to remove. As she is possessed, Olivia tries to kill Eric. Much to our disappointment, despite the fact that she stabs the fuck out of the guy, evidently the evil can be driven back by being beaten over the head with a chunk of porcelain. She tried to kill me. She tried to kill me. And that kills her. Of all the things that they listed in the movie that work to drive the evil away, blunt force trauma to the head isn't one of them. Along the theme of being fucking morons, they yank the shard out of Eric's chest, allowing the wound to bleed profusely both externally and internally. Then don't bother to cauterize it or anything. Fuck it, nothing a little duct tape can't fix. On the plus side, Eric starts to realize he fucked up. I did something terrible. She didn't mean to hurt her. But David's still a fucking moron. Oh yeah, I'm sure you're just bashing her over the head as a warning or something. He goes on that it's an evil force he has let loose, and he has the proof to show it. However, this is man's work, or something like that. For some reason, Natalie isn't important enough to be in this conversation, so she gets back in the kitchen where she belongs, just in time for the basement door to fly open, and the obviously possessed, obviously dangerous Mia starts crying for help. Clearly this is a trap, and Natalie isn't stupid enough to... I'm gonna come down there, okay? Obviously, it turns out that Mia is in fact not better, and still possessed by the evil thingamajig. It turns into a long scene of good old-fashioned torture porn, with Natalie trapped by her own stupidity, allowing Mia free reign to bite down on her hand. Fortunately, a man shows up to swoop in and save the day. Of course, it's David, so he's even stupider. Mia. Mia, I hate you fucking idiot! You know it's bad when even the killer starts breaking down in frustration as to how stupid the heroes are. Continuing the trend, they figure the best way to contain the supernatural evil is with a few steel chains. A slightly better plan is when Eric checks how the evil dead ended and tries his hand at burning the Necronomicon. Problem is, the remake takes some cues from psychological horror, so fuck logic, the book just doesn't burn, because. So he has a new plan. Along with David, he's going to figure out what clues lie within the book about the nature of the evil. Once he feasts on five souls, the sky will bleed again, and... The abomination will rise from hell. Again, information that nobody thinks is worth bringing up to Natalie. Where is she? Oh, she's back in the kitchen. I wonder if the actress had any choice words for fate about this. 
So while she's dealing with horrifying injuries related to this evil, the guys try and figure out the evil without her. Or Eric tries to figure it out as David tries to distract him with insufferable ignorance. What about those dead cats down in the basement? I mean, maybe they had some disease. I mean, some virus that it spread to Mia, and then she, she passed it to Lydia when she puked all over her face. The zombie virus theory? Ugh, for fuck's sake, David, stop trying to make this movie worse. As they bicker and bitch, Natalie's having a bit of a problem with her hand. As we could have guessed, this is a nod to Evil Dead 2 where Ash's hand got possessed, and he had to cut it off. The problem is Natalie's a lady, and ladies don't know how to use chainsaws. However, she's incredibly skilled at the art of the electric carving knife. Really don't know how that knocked the power out, though. I mean, yeah, you would need a fuck ton of electricity in one of those things to carve through bone, but it doesn't supercharge itself when it hits bone. It just, you know, it just doesn't work. But she succeeded, so she's all better now. That means the guys can get back to work figuring out how to fix the problem. Seems the only way to drive away the evil is to either do the classic body dismemberment or one of the two newly introduced weaknesses, cleansing by fire or live burial. As we could have seen coming, David's a useless shit and refuses to do it. But before Eric can set the place on fire... Oh, shit. Natalie didn't get better by cutting her own arm off. So, fuck effort. And if the sound effects are anything to go by, she's part predator now. So begins another fight scene. It seems to me like Eric is getting the ever-loving shit kicked out of him by the Neo-Deadites, while David remains relatively unharmed. With this in mind, Natalie goes in for the kill. David? Why are you hurting me? Cause you're a psycho crazy bitch trying to kill us with a nail gun? And a crowbar? And just being a bitch? Oh, and by the way, in case you're wondering, this is the evil trying to trick us and thinking she's all better now. No, actually, it's like when he dismembered her other arm that made her better. And she's just really stupid. Thus, Natalie dies the way she lived. Completely useless in every conceivable way. But now Eric's even more fucked up, so it rests on David to lay down the gasoline and set the house ablaze to defeat the evil once and for all. I can't do this. I can't do this. <sighs> Why not? We've been waiting all movie for you to do something worth a shit. Oh, he has a plan. David quickly MacGyvers up a... something. And heads downstairs to get Mia back himself. Like a fucking idiot. Unsurprisingly, she gets the jump on him and practically kills him right there. And it's only by Eric's grace does David survive, even though Eric, at this point, is so wounded, he only has enough strength to forgive David for not being around before he dies. Oh, the fuck, David? It would have been just as easy to lay him back across the stairs. I mean, at least then he's not going to be a bloated, waterlogged corpse. If you ask me, that's a little nicer. All this trouble was to get Mia out of there so he can throw a red dress on her, for some reason, and bury her alive. This is, like, the one and only time he's shown any competence at all, burying her despite the demon calling out swearing she's okay now. Also, coincidentally enough, there's a handy tree that lets him know when the evil has been dispelled. And then he digs her ass right the fuck back up, and we find out the goddamn device he threw together is a motherfucking defibrillator unit. Come on, Mia, come back to me, come on, please. The idea was to make a serious, scary version of Evil Dead because people thought that the original was just funny. How the hell am I supposed to watch this scene without laughing? Especially when after all of two shocks, the big-ass car battery magically runs out of life juice, and all hope seems lost. Nah, just kidding, she's fine. And I do mean fine, she's completely cured of her possession, and it looks like all physical damage done to her body has also magically healed itself. Sounds like a happy ending to me. Wait here. I'm gonna get the car keys. Okay? Yeah. Never fucking mind. As per the rules, David won't be right back, because Eric is now possessed, and has come to kill him! Shortly enough, David becomes wounded enough to become a liability, and locks Mia outside the cabin, firing the shotgun, and setting ablaze the gasoline. He sacrifices himself to save her, resulting in a tragic ending. But that's not the ending either. The abomination has come as a dark one has all five souls. Olivia, Eric, Natalie, 
Anyway, she was she was cured. Well, uh, David never got possessed in the first place. Mia got her soul back. The girl, the girl in the opening, she. Okay, she was cleansed by fire. She killed her mother. So that's three. Uh, the dog. Does that count? Still kind of coming up short here. Well, fuck the established rules, it's climax time! Or as I like to put it, they finally remember this is an Evil Dead movie! As the blood rains down very, very literally, it's said that they used somewhere in the neighborhood of 50,000 gallons of stage blood for this scene. In any case, Mia's our new hero. Surely that feels perfectly fine, as the fact that her soul has been elsewhere for the majority of this movie doesn't mean we feel considerably less invested in her character. Whatever the case may be, she gets her hands on the chainsaw, which just so happens to be the Abomination's weakness. Not that it's very weak to begin with. The left hand again? Jeez, it, it was Ash's right hand that got fucked up before. I mean, you don't have to do it, but if you're gonna do two hands anyway, you could do one of each. Still, despite being strong enough to topple a jeep one-handed, for some reason the Abomination can only manage to hobble around at one-eighth standard horror movie hobble speeds after losing a foot. Hell, at this point, Mia looks stronger, considering she can't even reach the chainsaw, and simply uses brute force not to pull her arm out, but rip her own hand right the fuck off. Thus, the showdown can complete. I will feast on your sword! Feast on this motherfucker! With an action movie one-liner. From a character we've had all of five minutes to give a shit about. Yay. Fuck it. Gory ending! Mia slices the Abomination's head in two, making it seem to be one of the least impressive final bosses in the Evil Dead franchise, and the blood rain subsides. She doesn't bother cauterizing her wrist in the burning house, as that would be smart. And if there's one thing these characters aren't, it's smart. So, that's that. And how does it stack up? Groovy. Stop lying, Bruce. Anyway, that was Evil Dead, and... Just what the fuck was the target audience for this movie? That's the part that has been the hardest for me to figure out. Being a critic, it's not just my job to say if I like something or not. It's my job to explain why, and also to try to imagine who would like something if I don't. Evil Dead is one of those movies that has many glaring problems for a lot of groups you would think could be target audiences. The first 20 minutes of the film are just bad. Tell don't show story building, uninteresting performances, and exposition dump after exposition dump make it a chore to go through. On that hand, maybe fans of So Bad It's Good can get a laugh at the problems. But then you get the next 40 minutes, which while the acting and character intelligence can suffer, does present itself as a decently put together horror movie with very nice visual effects. So then does Evil Dead work as a traditional horror movie once you get past the first 20 minutes? Not really that either, as the last 20 minutes is when the film remembers that it's an Evil Dead movie and pulls out all the stops. It's the only time the chainsaw is used, it's literally raining blood and starts to lean heavily over to action instead of horror. So would fans of Evil Dead really like it? Maybe, but they have to wait through an hour of bullshit just to get to a good part. The only audience I could figure would like this kind of movie the most is those who pick up movies whether or not they like them and analyze them scene by scene. You know, guys like me, critics. Why the fuck would you aim to appeal at critics, though? Critics don't know shit, trust me. I look at the shit no one cares about, like the quality of the angles and how sharp things look. To me, Evil Dead is a competent movie, but not excellent in any way. Coming in at three obvious warnings, oh my god, do you not even English, out of five. I really think that they might have gone at the angle to please critics first and foremost, as a lot of moviegoers really didn't like this film, but... And you got critics, like, you know, you got IGN there. They gave it a nine out of ten. I mean, I don't trust IGN even for their video game reviews, but still. But anyway, thank you all for watching. I've been Decker Shadow. And remember, you might not be able to tally up how many bodies you know, makes five souls on your own. I mean, it might not really seem to make sense, but trust me, it does. The Deadites use Common Core.
missed that. I wasn't looking. Oh well. <laughs> it really doesn't taste very good, honestly. <laughs> it doesn't taste like it. Mm. It's strangely sweet, though. Yeah. You're just gonna keep playing DS now. Beef, meat byproducts, soy grits, I, sugar. I, yeah. <laughs> He's so <still> filthy. <laughs> Kuro, you like that then? <laughs> Was that good? Huh? That good? Yeah, it is going at the end of the credits. Yes, it is. <laughs>